Police, fire, medical. Uh, I need uh, uh, emergency, please. I think it's, it's, it's right in front of my house. I, my husband just went out there. Lithia, Florida, 2022. A tight-knit community is shaken by the brutal murder of a 43-year-old elementary school teacher. This is a very quiet, very safe neighborhood where things like this just don't happen. And to hear that and then walk out of your door at 12 o'clock at night, is it's, it's a lot to deal with. A suspect is quickly apprehended whilst detectives start to piece together the timeline that led to this vicious attack. Once we kept building, everything kept pointing back to him. As the facts start coming together, police begin to suspect that this is not an isolated incident. We've learned that these two incidences were very, very similar, were almost both jealous, enraged incidents where he attacked another female up in Michigan. This is the story of Kay Baker and how jealousy spiraled into tragedy and a brutal murder. calm night around this Kittredge Drive, which is typically a quiet neighborhood. It's considered one of the nicer parts of the county. It's got the neighborhood there, but the next major road isn't, isn't any kind of road. There's people just walking up and down, really only going down there if you live down there or if you have business down there. In the middle of the night, 1230 at night, uh, there's not a lot of businesses open down there. Primarily just residential, working class neighborhood that you know people are, aren't just roaming the streets and looking to, to attack anybody. It is just after midnight on the evening of the 22nd of May, 2022, that local residents from the Lithia community report hearing a disturbance. And they heard what they described as a thump outside. This thump was followed by what they described as what sounded like somebody gasping or crying. They exited their house and they saw a person lying in the yard and they believed based on kind of the person's small stature, that it was a teenager who had maybe passed out drunk or something. When they got closer, they could see that this person was bleeding pretty severely, and they called 911. They were just kind of standing in their yard looking around, and uh, there wasn't anything obvious about what had happened to this person. Uh, I need an uh, uh, emergency, please. What? Uh, ambulance. Stay on the line. Uh, I think it's, it's it's right in front of my house. I, my husband just went out there. Tell they me, have tell me exactly uh, what happened. Lacerated, lacerated cuts. Okay, who's cut? Uh, 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 someone next door. Who is this? It, it's a, a teenager. Okay, male or female? I think it's a girl. She's she's just they have they have a major cut to their neck. They were definitely shocked because, like I said, this is a very quiet, very safe neighborhood where things like this just don't happen. And to hear that and then walk out of your door at 12 o'clock at night, is it's, it's a lot to deal with if you're not expecting that. EMS is right here. Hey, and all you guys too, who are out here and stay out here for a minute, okay? The deputies get there, they kind of determine what's going on, they try to render aid, they kind of start neighborhood surveys to kind of figure out exactly what's going on. The area is taped off with the crime scene, there's a lot of patrol units there, there's a lot of supervisors, and then our homicide section starts to get there. For the most part, it's, it's contained, it's safe, because by the time we get out there, it's normally about an hour or so after the, the incident had occurred. When I got there, the victim's body was on the ground. She was covered in a white sheet. At that point, law enforcement had put up crime scene tape. They were interviewing witnesses and just trying to make sense of the scene as a whole. You're probably gonna have detectives come and talk to you again. That's fine. Um, from the beginning. Yeah. What happened? How did you discover? Uh, well, I was actually asleep out here on the couch and the uh, wife and one kid was in Bedroom. The bedroom. Her okay. older they daughter were asleep. was asleep upstairs. She was asleep upstairs, and I heard this freaking scream, like, 
really bad. I was, and I thought it was my kid. I ran to my stairway, you know, and I said, Sophie, are you okay? And she's like, yeah, I'm fine. And I was like, are you sure? She was like, yeah. So I was like, well, I heard a scream. And so I came out here, and she was right there. Detective Edward Two and I did a initial walk through of the incident scene so we can kind of get a grasp of what exactly we're dealing with that evening. It was a violent, very sad scene. I go into the scene, I, I see the female deceased there initially, obvious trauma to her neck. It's at the hands of, of some kind of violence, some kind of homicidal violence. Any kind of physical evidence that might be laying on the ground, weapons, in this case there was some blood spatter areas that were of interest to us, as well as any kind of surveillance cameras, uh, witnesses, anybody that's kind of lingering around. Detectives quickly identify the victim. She is 43-year-old math teacher and mum of two, Kay Baker. Some of the neighbors provided the information to us that it looked like the female that lives at this house. We were able to confirm that through uh, eventually some fingerprints and, and her, her driver's license photo. Where she was laying was actually two houses down from where she lived. So she, she had her house, there was another house in between, and then she was between that house and the, the third house. She was kind of laying in a yard. There was no fence that connected her backyard to this area, so we were unsure if she ran from her house through the backyard or towards the front where she ended up in between these two houses. From everything that we've learned, talking to family and friends and neighbors, that she was a loving, caring, amazing woman. She was an elementary school teacher, which speaks volumes. She taught third grade math at Cypress Creek Elementary School, and she had a, a lot of uh, very close friends. She had a group of friends that they called themselves the Golden Girls, because I guess they sort of uh, saw themselves in the characters of the Golden Girls TV show. From everybody that knew her, it just, you know, she was a, a very delightful uh, person, a uh, very easy person to get along with. She was also very good with children. I think she had studied in college to become a teacher and had always wanted to work with children and really enjoyed teaching math at the school where she taught. Evidently so good at it that at one point the superintendent for the school district came to watch her teach. She also had two young boys of her own. She was in a very good relationship with her ex. They were co-parenting. Both were very successful. And, you know, she just seemed like a very good-hearted person. Police now cautiously approach Kay Baker's home just a few short meters from where her body is discovered. The deputies found the door open to her house, actually, and so immediately they went in the house to search for any other victims or even a possible suspect inside. Once they found that it was empty of any other person, they backed out of it. A search warrant was obtained to be able to go in and actually process it for evidence. The initial scene was the outside scene. Eventually, a search warrant was obtained so they could go into the house, and that's where we noticed that there was a knife missing from the butcher block, which was like a beak-shaped little paring knife that was missing. There was some damage to some doors that looked like people had been trying to hide in. And then, of course, we had the, the window that was removed on uh, the kid's bedroom. The window on the south side of her house, the screen was pushed out and the, the window was opened. It appeared as if somebody maybe crawled out of that window. And initially, the way it looked is that maybe she had climbed out there and ran to the spot where she ended up dying. It looked like somebody had barricaded themselves in the bedroom to try to get away from somebody and then ultimately decided that they needed to get out of the house to try to get away. Detectives continue to interview Kay's neighbors and start to piece together her last known movements. We learned that it was the last day of school and then one of the neighbors kind of pulled up her Facebook page and showed us that you know she had a boyfriend that was there. Talking to the neighbors and then even some of her friends, we learned a recent live-in boyfriend they had known each other for a long time, but had recently just started living together and, and dating, I think, a few months since he had gotten down from Michigan. And that's when we learned that his vehicle was in the driveway, and at that time he had been unaccounted for. As the investigation continues to unfold, the focus now shifts to locating a crucial element to solving this case, Matthew Terry, Kay's boyfriend. Lithia, Florida, May 2022. 43-year-old elementary school teacher Kay Baker is found murdered outside her neighbor's house. 
Kay's boyfriend, 47-year-old Matthew Terry, is unaccounted for. And as police search the crime scene, they discover a blood trail leading away from Kay's body. I remember walking down from the incident location, Kay Baker's house, walking the backyard of where they have kind of started to see the blood trail, and then walking in between the houses when we ultimately find where Kay Baker is deceased. So Detective Ratu and I drove around to the backside where there was a, a deputy that was kind of holding the initial crime scene. And then we just got out with some flashlights and we're like, you know, if it led into here, let's, let's see what we can find. And then I found a small blood drop on the other side of the thick brush from the house. And then Detective Ratu started looking as well and he could see that those blood drops were coming from the back of the house in that thick brush. Canine Champ comes, who is a bloodhound, and they're trained on using scent to kind of pick up a track and run with it. The bloodhound tracks for about the distance of a football field along the edge of the roadway, following the trail of blood, until eventually law enforcement comes to a very large, almost sort of dinner-sized plate pool of blood. Realizing that something there has changed, they call in aviation, who have special cameras that can see in the dark, can see infrared. They end up seeing what looks like maybe a body laying on the ground in the bushes. Right here? Yeah, right here. Is that going in? Off. Blood on the other side of the oak, uh, there. Off. Sheriff's on the if you're in the woods, make yourself known, dog's gonna bite you. The K9 unit picks up a scent and prompts investigators to action. Yeah. <laughs> We found Matthew Terry. He was only wearing a shirt and some underwear, and he had some wounds to his neck where he was bleeding. He was covered in blood and in his underwear, and he was in pretty bad shape at that point. He was somebody of interest to us to begin with, and then we go to find him. He's covered in his own blood as well as her blood. He's got some cuts on his hands and, and that kind of thing. It's indicative of being in some kind of struggle or, or a fight with a sharp object or a knife. Initially, at that point, he's obviously somebody we wanted to find to begin with, and now we see the state he's in. Um, so our, our red flag's up a little bit. He's found about 5 in the morning, about 5 hours after the original 911 call. He was lying there for hours upon end. There was lights, there were sirens, there was deputies involved. Um, there was an opportunity for him, if he was attacked, for him to come forward. Well, it was obviously very suspicious, but the fact that Mr. Terry had two injuries to his neck immediately raises concerns that something might have happened. There's the possibility that either he was attacked too, though the fact that he'd been laying in the bushes for hours and never called for help, even though law enforcement was maybe just 100 feet away from him, was suspicious. The other possibility, of course, is that he's self-injured and trying to start an initial claim of some sort of self-defense. He does end up having to go to the hospital, so we, we meet him there to try to speak with him about kind of his side of the story, expecting to hear some great explanation for everything, and ultimately he didn't want to talk to us, even with a lawyer. He said he had some scrapes to his arms, some cuts to his hands, as well as some puncture marks to his neck that were a little weird looking just on the surface. If you're being stabbed in the neck by somebody else, they would be a little more not as clean as they had looked, I guess. There were some doctors that had told us that it, it was possible that they were self-inflicted. 
As police continue to interrogate Terry, detectives also need to speak to Kay Baker's family. We had become aware that she had two young boys, but we quickly learned that she had shared the time with those boys with her ex-husband. Kay had separated from her husband. They had two boys who were young, elementary school age children. They had uh, moved into separate homes and started separate lives after their separation. They had shared custody. That's why on this particular night, Kay didn't have her boys with her. But all accounts suggested that Kay and her ex got along very well, had a loving relationship, and were being great parents to their children. And luckily, we met with the ex-husband right away and found that he had had the boys that night. We actually knocked on the door. It was early morning. It took them a little bit of time to answer the door. They were kind of asking us to identify ourselves. We told them we were the sheriff's office, and then eventually they came to the door, and we um, unfortunately ended up telling him the news and laying eyes on the children and making sure that they were okay. Talking with his now wife and knowing that they were dead asleep, and there was no evidence that he had been involved in this at all. Kay's official cause of death is quickly established. Our crime scene detective... Detective Van Gelder was out there that evening. The medical examiner's office gets contacted and the doctor came out to do initial findings and kind of give us some insight of how she was killed. Her findings was that she suffered a large laceration to her neck that severed some arteries and basically she had bled out there at the scene. Once the, the search warrant was obtained and we were able to get into the house, there was evidence that there was some kind of I would say altercation. We had some doorways that were kicked into doors as if somebody was in there and trying to get in. And then we obviously had the locked door that was with the window pushed out. And then the main one was when we accounted for all the knives in the butcher's block that bird's beak carrying knife was missing. At that point, our main focus was trying to find the, the weapon used. Since I was there from the get-go, I was very focused on trying to find the knife juries want to see the murder weapon. They ideally want to see it in the hands of the person who's accused. So a lot of effort was put into trying to find that. So we used metal detectors, hand search. We were in the area where he was found. We, we searched extremely hard and well. The issue was we were dealing with a small area where he was found, yes, but the, the area from where we know Kay Baker was deceased, the brush that he went through and probably about 100, 150 yards of rural highway with thick brush and a small knife that could have been thrown anywhere. There were ring cameras, but a lot of them were motion activated. None of them were really activated by any kind of vehicles or any other people walking by. It seemed pretty isolated from her house to where she was killed, which wouldn't have activated any of the other cameras. So no other video surveillance was obtained from the neighborhood. With local surveillance footage drawing a blank, detectives begin to re-examine Kay's last known movements prior to her murder. Detective or two did an amazing job of going back and actually finding out that it was the last day of school. She was a teacher. They were at the local bar, local hangout spot, just enjoying, celebrating that last day. She was with friends, some colleagues. She indicated that there was some issue at the bar. She maybe was aware that Matthew Terry has this kind of jealous history of whatever girl he's dating. So there was a little incident at the bar that she had brought up right away. It's not like she had to think back at something that happened. This was, I guess, something that happened at the bar that kind of consumed the night. During the evening, Kay got up to use the restroom and went to the restroom. And on her way there, she saw her friend as they kind of passed each other. They were having fun and started kind of dancing and playing around. Looks like they're just having a good time. There might be some music playing. So they just kind of throw their arms up and have a, an innocent little dance as some other patron walks by them. He also kind of looks like he wants to join in. He's just trying to get by them, but he also throws his arms up in kind of that playful dance. Nothing really more than that, and Mr. Terry evidently saw that and became jealous of what he had seen and started asking Kay about that when she returned to their table. You can just tell that at that point the mood had changed from a celebration to some kind of, like, jealousy where it's almost like he was accusing her of dancing with somebody at the bar and he witnessed it with his own eyes and he's trying to figure out what's going on. Nazi Terry becomes kind of pushy about confronting her about this what was going on why were you dancing with that guy and Everyone else seems to be telling Matthew Terry that it wasn't a big deal. I don't know if he seems like he can't let it go or if he just bottles it up and then, you know, confronts it once they get home later. On the way home, you know, he and Kay are driving back to her house and she calls her friend 
who had been at the bar with them and says, can you please tell Matt that I wasn't dancing with that guy or I wasn't flirting with that guy, something to that effect. Her friend gets on the phone and, you know, tells him, you know, you, there was nothing there and you know, tries to calm him down and they hang up and Kay sends a text to her friend and says, you know, sorry about that, you know, it's, it's so dumb and just kind of dismisses it. But it seems as if there's still that jealousy aspect of that incident that happened at that bar that continues throughout the evening. So I think friends were just, you know, uh, seeing what they saw at the bar, that they're making sure that they're okay, and eventually Kay tells them, yeah, everything's okay, you know, we're fine. And that's kind of one of the last time anybody hears from Kay Baker. Lithia, Florida, May 20th, 2022. Kay Baker, a 43-year-old elementary school teacher and mother of two, is found murdered outside her neighbor's house, where she has been stabbed a number of times. Within hours, police apprehend Kay's boyfriend, Matthew Terry, who is found hiding in nearby bushes. Delving into Terry's history, investigators uncover a chilling revelation, a prior assault on a woman back in 2017. We actually learned that he did some prison time. From what we were able to gather, once Detective Ratu was able to reach out to the Michigan detective, we'd learned that these two incidences were very, very similar, were almost both jealous, enraged incidents where he attacked another female up in Michigan. So the other attack is frighteningly similar. Once again, it's sort of a celebratory night. In the case of Michigan, it's St. Patrick's Day. Matt Terry and his then-girlfriend Michelle go out to a local bar. They're celebrating. Matt Terry is, again, drinking fairly heavily. Matthew Terry ended up attacking her and grabbed a knife and began to stab her and stabbed her repeatedly, and she was able to get away and escaped through the garage door of their home. He chased her and tackled her on the front lawn and was kind of grappling with her and continuing to try to stab her. Thankfully, there's a neighbor across the street who hears the commotion, comes outside, and breaks it all up. The defendant gets up and goes back into the home, taking the knife with him, leaving Michelle in the driveway bleeding. She's again been stabbed in the neck, as well as other parts of her upper torso, in the face and on the shoulders. When law enforcement comes, Matthew Terry is found inside the home. He is covered in blood, all on his chest and his arms. Sort of coincidentally, he's again in a shirt and a pair of underwear and no pants. He is taken into custody and ultimately claims a sort of self-defense argument saying that Michelle had actually attacked him and he had had to fight for his life and she had been stabbed in the process of trying to defend himself, which is why pretty early on we thought that Matthew Terry might have stabbed himself in the neck to make a self-defense claim because he'd already done this once before. Detective Vert 2 and I looked at each other and can say, if he's done it this before, then there's a great likelihood that he did this again. She had, I guess, gotten wind of what happened and reached out to me. I talked to her briefly over the phone initially, and, and she gave me the whole kind of story of everything, and it kind of sounded very similar to what happened, so it was very interesting to me. And she had said she tried to warn Miss Baker. From what I understand, he got a, a lighter sentence for that charge and only served a few years in Michigan. He got about three years in the Michigan prison system and then had probation to follow. All in all, it was a fairly light sentence. I mean, the laws are different in the state of Michigan than they are in Florida. I know in Florida, for something like that, that would be considered an unusual sentence, uh, given the violent nature of it. The defendant at that point didn't have any real record and so I think a judge looked at him and took some leniency on him. I know that people went up to Michigan to testify on his behalf. As it turns out, Kay Baker actually went to Michigan, and she even testified at the trial on his behalf to say what a good guy and what an honest guy he is and how unlikely it is that he would try to hurt anybody on purpose. I'm sure that that played a major role in ultimately the verdict and the decision for the sentence. She truly cared for this person, she loved this person, and she thought he was a, a good person which we later find out is, is not the truth. Police have heard and seen enough to make a decision to charge for the murder of Kay Baker. 
He was charged that same night with some anticipation that some of this evidence was going to lead to him. We can collect this stuff. We believe it's going to show results as we expect, but there was enough probable cause to charge him that night. He seemed intoxicated. He seemed kind of stoic about the whole thing. Even just getting the news, if you want to believe there's some other attacker out there, that he never brought any of that up. He's getting the news that his girlfriend has been killed, and he just doesn't react to that in any way. Once we kept building, everything kept pointing back to him. Matthew Terry grew up in a fairly normal American family. His family came from some means. They certainly weren't poor by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, he had a fairly normal childhood. He had a father and a mother who loved him, friends and family who were there and supportive through the various stages of his life. He ultimately graduated from high school, entered the military, served in the military for a period of years, got out, uh, and had, you know, established himself as a fairly normal person in the world. There wasn't anything unusual about him. People tried to suggest that he might have been changed by his time in the military, but it didn't appear that he had actually ever seen any sort of actual combat service. He wasn't in any place where like people were shooting at him or anything like that, which doesn't diminish his service, but uh, certainly suggests that he wasn't probably suffering from any sort of PTSD or anything like that. As the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office charged Terry, they feel confident about bringing him to justice. This one definitely sticks with me because it's just so brutal, and the fact that the defendant had just gotten out of prison for effectively doing the same thing. I ended up meeting the victim from the Michigan case and talking with her and listening to her account of what happened in Michigan and understanding how much it was basically the same story of what happened down here in Tampa. It was scary how similar it was. It also always sticks with you when you're dealing with the family and the next of kin. They've lost a loved one, and I always take it very seriously, the notion that they're counting on someone like me to ultimately get them some sense of justice. And so it's a very serious responsibility, and it's a heavy burden, but it's one that's important to, to take on because somebody's got to go to court and fight for justice for Kay and her family. Terry's legal team pushed for a speedy trial, something very unusual for a murder case. In this particular case, the defense chose to not waive speedy trial, and so that meant we had to go to trial in under six months. That's not normal in most murder cases. Typically, uh, defense attorneys will waive speedy trial, so they have lots of time to investigate all the evidence, to do all the depositions. But because they didn't waive speedy trial, we were kind of like on a rocket trying to get through everything as fast as possible. In my experience, it was one of the, the, the quicker um, cases that had gone to trial that I'd been a part of. And our state attorney's um, office did an amazing job with the state attorney being Justin Diaz and preparing us, getting witness statements, getting our statements, and getting us prepared and prepped and ready to go to trial because it did happen very quickly. It made things move at a very, very hectic and fast pace, but it was something that could be done basically had to put most everything else on hold and just work on this case. But for about six months of my life, I did nothing but the Matthew Terry case most days, day in and day out. I think there could be a couple reasons. One, obviously, I think that they are hoping that forensic results will not come back in time. Because the blood ended up being so important in this case, we have to send that off to a lab where scientists will then analyze it and look for DNA to tell us what is in any particular area where blood is encountered. Is that Kay's blood? Is that the defendant's blood? Is that a combination of their blood? That unfortunately takes time. Uh, science doesn't always move as fast as we want it to, and so the lab is working furiously to get those things done. But when you're talking about dozens and dozens of different swabs of suspected blood or from people's hands or from Kay's body, I think the defense is not waiving speedy trial in the hope that they can force the case to trial before all of the DNA comes back. Thankfully, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement did an excellent job. Typically in six months, we're lucky if we can get one round of testing, but because we were able to contact them and tell them the importance of the case, we actually knocked out two rounds of testing, and that made a huge difference at the end of the day for helping us identify the fact that Kay's blood was literally on the defendant's hands. I was really confident prosecutor on this case. I was very confident with Justin Diaz. Did a great job of prosecuting the case. He had his ducks in a row, so uh, there was pretty pretty high level of confidence going into it that, that he was going to be convicted. In less than a month, we've already 
taken the case to grand jury, we've obtained an indictment, and the defendant is now officially charged with first-degree murder. He goes to his first appearance in front of a judge where it's called arraignment. He enters a plea of not guilty, and then we're going to start the process of going through what's called discovery, where I'm turning over copies of police reports and photos and videos and other things that we might have in our possession to the defense attorney so they can look at all the evidence and ultimately talk to the defendant about what the evidence is against him. After that, we move into what's called depositions, which are chances for the defense attorney to conduct interviews with the various witnesses. Because we had witnesses out of state, we ended up traveling to Michigan to talk to some of those witnesses, as well as all the law enforcement and other witnesses that are down here in Hillsborough County. That's a fairly fast process. Matthew Terry's demeanor in court was mostly calm, polite. There were a few moments in court where he appeared to become emotional, particularly when they showed pictures of Kay Baker. There were some moments where he appeared to sob somewhat. He appeared to become a little bit emotional at certain points in the trial. He was just a very cocky, very arrogant in the way his mannerisms were. In my eyes, he had kind of been through this process already. He didn't get that heavy of a sentence. So I think there was some confidence with him going into the trial. We're only there for our portion. In this case, I was, I was there for several hours. We're sequestered from other witnesses, so once, once we do our part, we have to leave the courtroom and we can't really talk about anything with any of the other detectives or anybody involved. It was a rule of the courts. They don't want us sharing information. They don't want, if there's a defense theory that they're going with, they don't want us divulging that to the next witness who's going to testify and have somebody's uh, testimony be altered. I did testify in the trial. Detective or two was the main focus in the trial because he was the lead detective. I did testify to the blood that I found on the side of the thick patch of woods behind her house and searching for the knife and those kind of things. The police did a great job in this case. I have a lot of kudos to the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. I've worked with many of them before. They always do a great job, but in this case, they did a really, really good job. They knew that we were under the gun of speedy trial. They knew that there was a lot of stuff that needed to be done, and so they worked very diligent, especially in the early days, to build a very solid case. And then as we were progressing through the discovery process, once the case had been filed, they were working hand in glove with our office to assist us in anything we needed. Detective or two did an amazing job of just his interviews, the collection of the video, our crime scene detective, our crime scene investigators collecting evidence at the scene, you know, our, our canine deputies. It was just a total team effort. We even had the helicopter up in the air that night. The sheriff's office just really embodies that teamwork and effort, and it was just an amazing all-around job. Given Terry's similar previous crime, the district attorney's office feels it is paramount to include these details in this trial. So normally in a case, when a defendant is accused of a crime, you can't talk about any other crimes they've ever committed. The jury has to make the decision based solely on the evidence from this particular investigation. However, in the state of Florida, we have what's called Williams Rule evidence, what is also known as similar fact evidence. If there is another crime that has been committed and the facts are so similar, there are limited reasons why you can admit the evidence of the other case to prove something important in the current case. A judge listens to the evidence that's going to be admitted and listens to the evidence in this case and has to basically make a determination on are the facts and circumstances similar enough and is there something important that that other case will help explain in the current case? The judge decided that there was a sufficient similarity between the two different crimes, the one in Michigan and the one in Tampa, and we were able to put on some evidence from the Michigan case. Specifically, we put on the victim from Michigan, and she came and told the same story about how they had been out drinking, celebrating, it had turned into an argument in the home, it had turned violent, she had tried to run away, he had chased her down, he had stabbed her repeatedly with a knife from a butcher block and had injured her in the neck. With police and the DA's office expecting to hear a self-defense excuse, they are shocked at Terry's defense argument. I think they shied away from a self-defense argument, but then ultimately they went to an argument I didn't even remotely expect. When we got to trial, I was ready to argue if they were going to argue self-defense, and the defense was sort of cagey about whether or not they were ever going to argue it. I think they were waiting to see what they wanted to do, and so 
they were keeping their cards very close to their chest. And in closing arguments, the defense got up and basically told a story where they suggested that there was a, a phantom killer, some third person that we didn't know, had never heard of, and there was no reason to believe existed, that this person had somehow gotten into Kay Baker's home, that he was the one responsible for attacking Kay and the defendant inside the home, that he had chased Kay Baker, and then ultimately he had been outside laying in wait for her. It was very confusing, and it didn't seem to comport with the evidence at all. Toward the end of the trial, Matthew Terry expressed some dissatisfaction over not being allowed to essentially testify and tell his side of the story. And it was something that kind of came out when the jury was already deliberating. He told the judge that he wanted to testify, but that his lawyers had advised him not to, which is kind of standard in a lot of criminal cases. They don't want defendants to testify because it opens them up to being cross-examined by the prosecutor. Both police and the district attorney's office have done all they can for this infamous murder trial. Now it is up to the jury to deliberate and decide a verdict. Will they put Matthew Terry away for life? Lithia, Florida, May 2022. 43-year-old elementary school teacher Kay Baker is found outside her neighbor's house covered in her own blood and is later pronounced dead. Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office charges her boyfriend, Matthew Terry, with her murder when he is found hours later hiding in the bushes not far from her home. After a considerably fast trial and hearing Matthew Terry's bizarre defense argument, the jury now deliberate their verdict. I don't think the jury was swung by it at all. I mean, the, the story just didn't make any sense. And I remember giving my second closing argument, basically explaining how it just didn't make any sense. You were going to have to believe that some man, for no apparent reason, had killed Kay Baker. And then, as the defense suggested, while Kay Baker's being killed, Matthew Terry came outside of the home looking for his girlfriend for no appreciable reason. And as it just turns out, the, the killer is just hanging out, laying in wait, waiting for Matt to come by so he can try and kill Matt too. And it just it didn't make any sense. The jury took about an hour to come back in terms of deciding that Matthew Terry was guilty. That's pretty fast, especially given the fact that it's a first-degree murder case. My experience is normally juries go back there and they at least want to give it a full, thorough discussion, and that just takes time. However, in this case, we had a lot of really, really great evidence and a lot of really great witnesses. And I think that once the defense had put forward the notion of the phantom killer, which wasn't remotely plausible in any way, I don't think it was hard for the jury to see that the defendant was guilty, especially when they knew that he'd already done it once before in Michigan. He was found guilty for first-degree premeditated murder. It's a, a feeling of accomplishment and more along the lines of getting justice for Kay Baker and the justice for her family that they deserve. Following Terry's conviction for Kay's murder, the judge faces the weighty task of determining his fate while hearing emotional impact statements from Kay's family and friends. So victims in the state of Florida have a chance to come forward and give a victim impact statement to tell the judge about how the crime has affected them in terms of whatever loss that they have suffered, whether it's property that's been damaged or a loved one who's been killed, but also to talk about what they think justice merits in this case, whether they want the defendant to go to prison for life or they want him to get a certain number of years or they want some sort of mercy shown. It's a chance for the victim to tell the judge what they think is the right outcome and also a chance to have the defendant hear from the victim's mouth directly how all of this has impacted them. Additionally, the prosecution urges the court to consider imposing the death penalty on Terry. To get the death penalty in the state of Florida, the state has to prove at least one of what they call aggravating factors. And in this case, I believe the aggravating factors that the state cited were that Matthew Terry was previously convicted of another violent felony, and that, two, that the murder of Kay Baker was especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel. They found that the state had proven that Matthew Terry was convicted of a violent felony previously, but on the question of whether the murder was especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel, they said no. And I remember when they read that part, that was kind of 
a moment when it kind of became evident that this wasn't going to go in the state's favor. And the next question they had to answer was, are the aggravating factors sufficient to warrant a death sentence? And their answer to that was no, because the, the state had only proven the one aggravating factor and they felt like, I guess the jury essentially found that aggravating factor was not sufficient for a death sentence. And so the sentence was life in prison without the possibility of parole. For the family, I think it's a tremendous relief. They obviously sit in the courtroom listening to this testimony, hearing graphic discussion of how their loved one was murdered and the injuries they suffered. And they're just sitting there they can't ever be certain. No matter how good a case is, prosecutors can't ever promise that it's always definitely going to be a guilty. And so they're always sitting there just waiting, hoping, dealing with the possibility that this could be a not guilty. It's kind of the same thing for me. It's very different. Uh, I feel responsible for trying to make sure that the defendant is held accountable for what he's done. And so once I know that he's going to be held accountable, it's also a very big relief for me as well, a chance to turn and look at the family and tell them that their trust and their patience has been well rewarded and that the defendant is now really going to have to answer for what he's done. Thanks to the tireless work of all those involved in advocating for justice for Kay, from detectives to family, a vicious and jealous killer is jailed for life and the harm he causes to women is finally at an end. This one will definitely stick with me with the, how gruesome um, her injuries were and then just remembering that night and just the teamwork and hard work and working with uh, Detective Ratu. I know that jealousy was a big factor. I know that from the Michigan case, as well as what I see here in the Tampa case, in both cases, I think Matthew Terry was If not jealous, he was insecure, but there was definitely some sort of worry that some other man was going to come and muscle in and take his girl. This was a senseless, needless, brutal crime, and Kay Baker deserved none of this. Uh, And it's heartbreaking to think that she's gone and that there are so many people who loved her so dearly who now have to grieve her and remember who she was but don't get to enjoy her in the future. On March 22, 2018, police receive a call informing them that a farmer in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, has reported the arrival of a distressed young woman named Ezra McCandless at his doorstep. I'm calling 911. What's the address of the emergency? This is Don Sippel calling, and I have a, a young lady that just came to my house, and somebody attacked her, and she needs a doctor. Her, her clothes are all torn. She was covered in mud up to her knees. She had blood on her clothing. She was very distraught, seemed rather confused. It wasn't until later on when she was able to take a shower at the hospital that some of her memories seemed to come back to her. And that's when she told investigators that she was attacked by Alex Woodworth. Alex Woodworth is a local substitute teacher, but when police attempt to locate him, they draw a blank. We couldn't find him, so we decided to go out there and talk to Don Sippel and see if there was anything else that we could learn. And as I was standing on the roadway, I noticed footprints in the mud. Detectives follow the footprints and come to an abandoned vehicle stuck in the mud. It belongs to Ezra McCandless, and slumped in the footwell of her car is the lifeless body of Alex Woodworth. You've got a victim stabbed 16 times. This would have absolutely been a textbook case of rage killing. I think what happened was premeditated. This was an attack that he didn't see coming. An ex-boyfriend of Ezra McCandless comes forward. His name is Jason Mengel. At the same time that that came about, 
Jason Mangle came to the police department. He mentioned that earlier in the day, he went to Racy's coffee shop, and while he was there, as he described it, she burst through the door, said that she had a crazy look in her eyes. We started to learn that there was a love triangle between Alex, Jason Mangle, and Ezra. Ultimately, Ezra wanted to be with was Jason. She needed to try and cut Alex out of the mix, and she got wrapped up in her own mind and did a horrible thing. But Ezra McCandless is claiming self-defense. Is it even possible that she could be consumed by jealousy to the point of murder? I think a scorned woman is definitely capable of committing some of the worst crimes there are. Claire, Wisconsin, the area is buzzing with creativity, full of trendy bars and a community of creatives who gather at Racy Delane's Coffee Lounge. Eau Claire has been described as being a big little town, meaning in a sense it's, it's pretty big geographically, but the people who live there all seem to know each other and it seems to be a pretty nice place to live and, and build a community. Eau Claire is a college town, so there is a younger demographic here, but there's also a lot of young families because people do come here for the college, love the community, and they'll stay here and they'll raise their families. So it's a very family-oriented place. Racy's is a coffee shop that is near campus. It's near the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire. I like to equate it as a almost like a central perk from the show Friends. It's that cozy, that little bit of artsy, little bit of alternative, you know, that kind of vibe. So it's a very, very welcoming, open coffee shop. In March 2018, around 4.15 p.m., a young woman named Ezra McCandless arrives at the doorstep of dairy farmer Don Sipple in the rural area of Springbrook, Eau Claire. At the time, when Ezra pounded on his front door, he was eating dinner and when he opens the door, Ezra was standing there claiming to have been attacked. Call me 911. What's the address of the emergency? This is Don Sippel calling, and I have a, a young lady that just came to my house, and somebody attacked her, and she needs a doctor. Her, her clothes are all torn. And okay, and she's by herself? She's by herself. She walked to my house here just recently. She was extremely upset. She was covered in bruises. She had some blood, particularly around her mouth. And when Dawn Sipple was just trying to get some basic information from her, she really couldn't remember anything that had happened to her. She didn't know who attacked her. She just kept saying she's hurting everywhere and she needed help. She gets transferred to Mayo Hospital here in Eau Claire. Officer Corey Reeves goes and talks to her, and then Ezra's admitted into the hospital for her safety and to make sure she's okay from this traumatic incident. I went to the hospital to speak with Deputy Shields and to help interview Ezra in her emergency room. And she provided the name Monica Carlin to Deputy Shields, so there was some issues trying to get an actual identification on her. Monica Carlin was her name before, and then she had it legally changed to Ezra McCandless. Not only is there confusion over Ezra McCandless's name, but detectives also discover she has had a challenging childhood. She's a 19-year-old teenage girl that dropped out of college who ended up in Eau Claire because life sort of drifted her there. She was born to a teen mom. Her mom was just 14 years old when she got pregnant and gave birth to Ezra. So that's, from the beginning, just a really hard way to, to grow up and to start your life. So the struggles early on were definitely, were definitely there for Ezra, being born to such a young mother. And it sort of seemed to want to start somewhere fresh in life and really create her own identity. 
Ezra was a very artistic person. She enjoyed the creative side to herself, and she even used her own car, a Chevy Impala, to be sort of her her canvas. Sergeant Corey Reeves conducts an interview with Ezra McCandless. She was curled up in a hospital bed. She had the blanket pulled up to her face. Really, the only part of her that I could see was her nose and her eyes. And she was essentially in the fetal position on the bed uh, until I came in and tried to talk to her. At that point, she sat up on the bed. She started rocking back and forth. She still had the blankets up by her mouth. She repeated several times. It was dark and scary. She, she didn't have a great memory about what had happened or where she was that day. She was crying but didn't see any tears. There were cuts in her pants to where you could see cuts into her body, into her flesh. The words boy were carved in her arm. And she had first said that Alex Woodworth was the one who did it. She said she was sitting in the passenger seat. Alex was sitting in the driver's seat. And he reached over held her arm down and took out a knife and then carved the word boy into her arm. And she said that's what he referred to me as, his boy. This turned out to be very significant to the story and to the investigation because come to find out that when Ezra was younger, when she was in high school, she experienced a lot of gender identity issues. She struggled with thinking whether she was a male or she was a female. And she really struggled with how not only she identified herself, but also how she wanted other people to identify her. So having the word boy carved into her arm was really sort of significant of the gender issues that she experienced younger in her life. Boy was written from starting at the elbow was the letter B, and down to the wrist was the Y. And it was written as if it was done with the right hand. If Alex would have done it, it would have been completely backwards. It would have been, the B would have been at the wrist, and the Y would have been up at the elbow. So that didn't make sense. Ezra requests that her ex-boyfriend, Jason Mengel, come to the hospital. Detectives then interview Mengel at the police department. Jason mentioned that he was in the military, that he was deployed fairly often for training. He talked about his relationship with Ezra a little bit. Uh, He was 33 years old. She was 19 years old. They dated on and off again for nine months. He said that they would refer to each other as husband and wife, even though they weren't actually married. More recently, he'd been deployed, and Ezra told him that she no longer wanted to be with him. He said he was sad about this, but that they continued to communicate with each other. He learned that she started seeing Alex. He knew that she dated him before. And he mentioned that earlier in the day, he went to Racy's coffee shop. And while he was there, uh, as he described it, she burst through the door, said that she had a crazy look in her eyes. He tried to talk to her. She basically just shrugged him off. I believe she wanted to meet with Alex to talk to him. She wanted to get a hat back from his apartment and then was out the door. Jason decided to ride his bicycle to Alex's house. And that's when he saw Ezra's car parked out front and started sort of pacing back and forth in front of Alex's house, waiting for Ezra or Alex to come outside. And after about 45 minutes of waiting, he decided to go into Alex's house himself to make sure everything was okay because his conversation and interaction with Ezra was just, it just seemed off earlier that day. Now, according to Jason, they were deep in conversation, seemed okay, maybe an intense conversation. So Jason decided to go back outside where he was confronted with the police. Somebody else called in a suspicion complaint on Jason standing there watching from a distance. Eau Claire Police Department arrived. Jason explained to them why he was there and what he was doing and and that he was concerned because Ezra was kind of not in the right state of mind. I was paranoid because she had fucking like fire in her eyes. Okay. So I 
Who's your, who's the girlfriend? Ezra McCandless. Okay. I was just worried because, like... Was the door standing open over there when you got there in the knocked, car? I knocked, like, three times. I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear a scuffle or okay. anything. So, knock, knock, yelled, opened the door, and I heard her say, let him help you. Let him help you. So then I said, hey, is everything okay? Is everyone all right right now? I mean, I'm a medic in the military, so, like, I was paranoid. I was paranoid that someone was going to do something irrational. Okay. And and they're in the house on the corner here, or yeah, which... they're on. The, I think they're fine, though. I mean, I don't okay. know. I'm, I'm just. I just uh, saw the door to the car was standing open too. Was yeah, open I wanted to turn her car off. Her car was running, so that's why I was like worried because it was running, and I was like, okay, uh, what's going on? Like, what's going on? Is everything okay? Okay. I don't think he's dangerous, but I don't know. Do you know what his name is? Alex Alex Woodsworth. Okay. Or Woodsworth, Woodsworth. Yeah, I think it's Woodsworth or Woodsworth. Eventually, Eau Claire Police Department goes across the street and talks to Ezra, Ezra and um, Alex and kind of finds out what's going on. They kind of blow it off, and they get in their vehicle, Ezra's vehicle, and leave. And uh, Jason's kind of left to... He actually has a conversation with them before they leave. I think Jason uh, truly had a concern, uh, you know, what Ezra was up to that day. But the burning question remains, with Ezra McCandless continuing to claim assault, where is Alex Woodsworth? In 2018, Ezra McCandless arrives at a rural farm in Wisconsin, Eau Claire. Covered in blood, she is disoriented and unable to recall the details of her ordeal, but asserts that she was assaulted by her partner, Alex Woodworth. McCandless's ex-boyfriend, Jason, informs detectives that he had seen Alex earlier that day and that he and Alex had spoken. Detectives are currently unaware of Alex Woodworth's whereabouts and are actively working to locate him. I remember sitting in our conference room and we were saying to each other, like, well, where is Alex in this? Because police officers had contact with Alex and we're starting to get concerned because she's in a condition that will lead us to believe that it's possible that something happened and we can't find Alex. We started doing our work by contacting family. I remember calling Alex's mom. He's checked out of the local, all the locations where he might be, according to his mom. I think one was the coffee shop, Racy Delaney's. Another one was the Joint, which is a tavern. And then the other one was his house on Cameron Street. I went to Alex's house on Cameron Street in Eau Claire. He wasn't there. Uh, his roommate was there. His roommate didn't know where he was. His roommate tried calling Alex. Alex's phone went straight to voicemail. After that, we basically ran out of leads. During the course of the investigation and interviewing people about Alex, everyone we talked to said he was a gentle person. He cared for Ezra. He loved Ezra. He, according to people, never in a fight, never harm anybody, willing to help everybody, loved everybody. If he was going to fight, it was going to be with words. He was going to school to become a philosopher and teach philosophy. That's what his dream was. It wasn't until later that night that I went back to the police department, had a discussion with my commanding officer and um, expressed some concerns about Alex's whereabouts and the fact that we couldn't find Ezra's vehicle. Ezra remembered something about a frog statue. She mentioned Owen Park. Eau Claire has a statue tour where they rotate statues, part of a sculpture competition. And at that point, I remember that there was a frog statue in Owen Park. And she told me that she was at Owen Park sometime between 1 and 4 o'clock. Uh, I checked the cameras and I never saw her vehicle or her uh, enter or exit the park. Unable to obtain a precise timeline from McCandless, the detectives decide to revisit Don Sipple's farm in Springbrook. We kind of all determined that it's going to be worthwhile for us to head out to that farm because if this girl's walking down a county road barefoot, covered in mud, possibly some blood on her, and in the condition that she was in, Somebody probably saw her, even though it's a rural area, and people drive up and down the roads there. So we were surprised that she had supposedly walked all the way up to this farmhouse and hadn't been 
seen by anybody. Our thoughts were she couldn't have come from very far because if she had, there would have been other calls of this girl walking down the street. So we decided to go out there and talk to Don Sipple and kind of look around a little bit and see what, uh, kind of get a lay of the land and see if there was anything else that we could learn. We knew what kind of car she had. We knew that her Impala, her Chevy Impala was very distinctive. She had done a lot of artwork, I guess you could say, drawing on the vehicle. So it was very easy to identify. It's white, so it should stick out. As that's happening, I stayed down on the road, which was a pretty good distance from the house. I'd say maybe a hundred yards. As I was sitting there, I got out of my vehicle. I was just bored because they were up doing the interview and I didn't, I wanted to look around and see if there was anything maybe in the ditches along the road that she might have dropped. As I was doing that, there I could see a like a, a farm access road that went off to the south off of the road that I was on springtime so there's a lot of mud and water runoff and as I was standing on the roadway I noticed footprints in the mud as I got closer and looked at them I could see that the footprints were not shoe impressions they were you know clearly a barefoot or a socked foot so I called Detective Proc and I as they were interviewing Mr. Sipple and I just said hey uh you know, I got some footprints here in the mud. I think we need to investigate this further, you know. And they were close enough in distance to the Sipple house that it's entirely possible she made it from that road to his house without a car going by. So we thought that these are probably her footprints coming out of the woods. So I waited for the other detectives to come down. I had some binoculars in my, in my detective vehicle and we started making our way up the dirt road and kind of crested a hill and we could see Ezra's vehicle, my binoculars, I could see that the vehicle was stuck in some mud, probably 100 yards, 200 yards away. And there's a bunch of stuff outside the vehicle, like just random things from your car that look like they were kind of just strewn about on the ground around the vehicle. And I could see what appeared to be the upper torso of a human body sticking out the back driver's side open door of the vehicle. They took video and photographs as they walked into the area where this vehicle was located. An old military type trailer that was parked back in there in this area. So this vehicle stuck in the mud, Chevy Impala, all painted very odd things on the outside of their vehicle. The painting on her vehicle was a bird riding a bicycle on the roof of her car that she apparently had painted herself. The upper half of his body was hanging out the rear driver's side door. The lower half of his body was in the footwell of the rear passenger, rear driver's side. He was clearly deceased, uh, looked like he had a scarf around his neck. We also noticed that there was blood outside and we could see that there was a bunch of items that were probably in the car scattered around. There was a, a pillow laying there with like a fox, the face of a fox on it, and a muddy footprint on that pillow, a deer antler laying there next to the head of this victim until we looked into it a little bit more and obviously there was significantly more wounds than what a deer antler uh, would cause and, and a pair of boots laying there all bloody. Turned out they had blood on them, but uh, in eventually find out those are Ezra McCandless's boots that were laying there in the middle of where this crime had taken place. The victim is confirmed as 24-year-old Alex Woodworth and his body is taken for an autopsy. There was uh, 16 different stab and slice wounds identified on him. We could identify just from the initial photos three different slices on his throat and multiple stab wounds, mostly on his left side and his rib cage, lower abdomen, uh, right about his belt line. Most of his injuries were around his neck, his back, his sides, the groin, but nothing really on his forearms or on the palms of his hands, a defensive manner. He didn't put up a fight, is what it would tell us, that he was either attacked unsuspectingly me personally, if somebody's attacking me with a knife, they're going to have one heck of a fight on their hands. And it didn't appear that he probably defended himself very much. Alex, unfortunately, would have been alive for probably a significant amount of time after the attack. The 
Medical examiner later on determined that none of the stab wounds in and of themselves were fatal. So based on that evidence, he likely survived for a good amount of time. Again, we have the evidence of the scarf being wrapped around his neck, possibly as a way to try to stop the bleeding. And we know that his body was found half outside of the car. So was Ezra trying to put him back in the car? Was that his way of trying to escape and maybe try to get some help? But he definitely suffered. It wasn't a quick death. Detectives move forward with a follow-up interview with McCandless, seeking to unravel the mystery behind the brutal killing. Is this 19-year-old woman an innocent victim, or is this story more sinister than it appears? In 2018, Ezra McCandless arrives at a rural Springbrook farm in Wisconsin, but is marked with the word boy superficially cut into her arm. Despite her claims of an attack by her lover, Alex Woodworth, she is unable to recall the details. March 24th of 2018, Dunn County asked that I assist with the interview of Ezra, mainly because I've already have rapport with her. I've talked to her at this time a handful of times about her previous cases. So I meet with her again at the hospital. We go into a conference room and I have her sit by the door and tell her, you're free to leave at any time. We just need to talk about what happened. I'm trying to fill in the blanks. And so we sit and talk. And, and eventually I inform her that we have found Alex and her car. It was kind of shock. And so as we were going talking, she started talking about how Alex came. And she was in the, the car got stuck and Alex came from behind her and Alex tried cutting her pants off. And that's where the cuts in her pants were from. Um, and then she also said the same thing about the cuts on her shirt, that he was trying to cut her shirt off. He kept trying to grab me in the back of the car, so I just started to defend myself as fast as I could. You said you had the knife. Where were you cutting him? I just was going anywhere and everywhere I could. Okay. He just kept grabbing me and grabbing me and grabbing me. The reason she said that she stabbed him so much was to get him to stop because she was said he would kept on attacking her and that's so she needed to stab him to stop him because that's what her dad told her to do we were able to figure out the knife was actually given to her from her father that she had it in her car for defense and after the incident took place the stabbing of Alex she took the knife with her and the knife was eventually found in the ditch away from the car she talked about how she tried to grab the knife of the blade to get it from her, and that's where the cut on her hands came from. And then she said that as they were in the car, she was fighting with him. He ended up dropping the knife, and that's when she was able to get a hold of the knife, and she stabbed him. If it's a defensive wound, and even think about it, if you're going to grab a knife, it's not going to be just like a little grab. You're going to grab onto that, and if it's a sharp knife and if someone pulls it, it's going to cut your hand wide open. And hers were as if you took your nail and scratched it across your palm of your hand a couple times. They were very superficial, no stitches. Basically, they put band-aids on them. And these were all documented by the emergency room doctor. And he even called them self-inflicted. And they weren't traumatic. They weren't inflicted by somebody else. No one's going to sit there and let someone carve a word into them and not be moving their arm fighting or that. The lines were too perfectly straight. So once I confronted her with that, she admitted that she carved the word boy into her arm. When we pressed it, she said, I just wanted to remember. And that was it. He didn't do that to you, did he? You carved boy into your own arm. Is that right? This was a shock to the community. This was not something that anyone had really experienced or heard about. And especially as more of the details of the case started to become public, when you're talking about the age of the victim, when you're talking about the age of, of Ezra, this really was something that, that rocked this community. I don't think anyone wants to think that a 19-year-old, small stature female is capable of something like this. I don't think, I think as a society, we just, we just don't want to think they're capable of that. 
Upon confessing to detectives that she disposed of the murder weapon, investigators study the evidence at the crime scene and observe additional discrepancies in her initial account. You know, we eventually started to piece it together that this, her story's BS. It's, it's not making sense. And based off from his injuries, you know, the one that really sticks in my mind is the three distinct cut wounds across his throat. That's not self-defense. That's fully intentionally of killing somebody. Stabbing somebody in the groin, in the lower abdomen, in the left side, in the back. There is clear intent to to kill somebody with, with those wounds. You know, there's different theories. Did she try and get Alex after she stabbed him to death and, and slit his throat three times? Did she try and get him back into the car and try and get her car out of there to move the scene? Did he get in the car himself? The biggest part of the investigation would have taken place right there in and around Ezra's car. Not just where Alex's body was discovered in the back seat, but also looking around the car. And I think during the course of the investigation, that's where they uncovered the most amount of evidence that seemed to contradict her story. For instance, finding the majority of, of Alex's blood outside of the car. Finding the blood outside of the car is pretty telling because Ezra's story was that they were interacting inside of the car and that's where she claimed to have stabbed him in self-defense. Well, that's problematic because investigators found the majority of the amount of blood outside of the car. If she was telling the truth about her story, the blood should have been found inside the car. There's a, a bloody footprint on the roof of the car at an angle that just doesn't make sense. So obviously we know that Alex didn't put the muddy footprint on the ceiling of the car. That had to have come from Ezra because her boots were off and her socks were muddy. So, you know, did she try and drag Alex into the car to try and get the car moved and, and move the scene of the homicide so it wasn't discovered there? I think there was a, a significant time there that she really went, oh, shit. what am I going to do now? He's dead in my car. I can't move my car. And I think there was, you know, maybe up to several hours that she, she sat there trying to figure out how to spin this tail um, and causing injuries to herself to make it look like she was attacked, that I, she didn't want to jab herself or stab herself significantly to cause herself too many wounds, so really all of her, her injuries were superficial scratches. So I think she spent a significant amount of time there after Alex was dead. She took Alex's cell phone with him. She didn't have a cell phone of her own. Now, when investigators asked her what happened to Alex's cell phone because it wasn't with him inside the car, she originally said that she took it so she could call for help. But that was discovered later on to not be true because the cell phone was found broken and which Ezra later claimed she fell, and that's how Alex's cell phone eventually broke. But there's no evidence su suggesting that Ezra ever used Alex's phone to try to get help. If Ezra would have just walked away, it would have absolutely been prevented, or even after the attack, if she would have just used Alex's cell phone to dial 911 and even say that she made a mistake, he probably would have survived, and we wouldn't be talking about a murder. But what is the underlying motive behind the murder of Alex? We want to find out what, you know, what led up to this. Like, what, what caused this incident to occur? Was this uh, self-defense? Was there a, a fight that occurred? Was there any kind of motive that she might have had for this to happen? We interviewed family, friends of both Ezra and Alex, some of Alex's professors, Alex's friends and family. And we started to learn that there was a kind of is like a love triangle between Alex, Jason Mengel, and Ezra. We started to paint a picture that, you know, Ezra was struggling. When you take all those things and put them together with, with the, the total picture here, to me, we were just dealing with a deeply disturbed uh, woman who had a, an affinity for Jason Mengel to the point that she was willing to murder Alex Woodworth. 
Ezra is someone that can pretty easily manipulate people. I think Ezra comes across as being this sweet, nice, artsy, creative young girl, but deep down, I don't really think that's who she is. But I think she's able to use that to manipulate people and to get people to like her and give her what she wants. But I think she can easily turn into a very different person when she's threatened. I don't think Ezra had it in her to ever walk away from this situation. I don't think she was ever willing to walk away from any of these relationships that she had with any of these people because that would mean the attention was being taken away from her. And I don't think she's the type of person that's going to walk away from that. All signs indicate that this was a surprise attack driven by the desperation to control a love triangle gone wrong with tragic consequences. In 2018, Ezra McCandless arrives at a rural Springbrook farm in Wisconsin, injured, bloodied, and bearing a superficial cut on her arm with the inscription, Boy. She claims that her lover, Alex Woodworth, restrained her and inflicted the injuries, but this statement is later proven false. Shortly thereafter, Alex Woodworth's lifeless body is found in the same area, with 16 stab wounds and no defensive injuries. This leads investigators to consider it an attack driven by a jealous desire to separate Alex from her relationship with Jason Mengel. Contrary to McCandless's version of events, the evidence discovered at the crime scene contradicts her narrative. I think the impact of the local community was a little bit of shock because they were seen around the community. You know, they were at Racy's, they were at the Joint, they were at all of these places where the art community hung out, where a lot of people hung out. And so people had known them and recognized them. So I think the community seeing that was quite shocking. Obviously never know what's going on when, you know, a person's life next to you, but that all of this was going on, that was unsettling. The Racy's community was thrilled. They wanted her gone. They wanted her away. That's a very tight-knit group of friends, community there, and they were in shock. They were saddened. Everyone loved Alex. They wanted Alex back, but unfortunately we couldn't do that. So the next best thing was her gone. They didn't want to see her ever again. And on April 6th, 2018, Ezra was arrested for first-degree intentional homicide. Um... She was taken from the hospital and went to Dunn County Jail. Detectives gather the evidence to prepare for trial. She lawyered up. Uh, there wasn't much of an opportunity to talk to her much more other than her initial couple stories after she was confronted with finding her vehicle and Alex's body. Her family got an, an attorney involved right away and secured a, an attorney for her. And so there wasn't much of an opportunity to interview her anymore. The physical evidence kind of spoke for itself, but there also was a lot of questions about the physical evidence that we couldn't answer, you know. Like, how did Alex end up in the car? You know, only Ezra knows that um, because Alex can't speak for himself anymore. You know, so I think we're pretty confident in our investigation going into this, not knowing exactly what Ezra's going to, what her defense attorney's going to claim at, at trial. But as an agency, I think we felt pretty comfortable. I think the DA, the prosecuting attorney, felt pretty comfortable going into this case with what we had. We had expert testimony lined up to show that these injuries to her were self-inflicted. It's a large, many, many pieces of a puzzle that you could have got to try and put together, present to the DA. The DA has to try and tell this story to a jury and, and convince them that what we have discovered through our investigation proves that she, you know, intentionally murdered him. By October 2018, when the case went to trial and Ezra was charged with first-degree intentional murder, she surprisingly didn't show any remorse. I think she went into that trial still trying to play the victim in all of this, and she was determined to stick to her original story. It does not surprise me at all to find out that Ezra decided to take the stand in her own defense. Although most criminal defendants choose not to, 
The reason why it doesn't surprise me is because, by all accounts, Ezra liked the attention. She liked to be the star. She liked to be the center of everyone's attention. And I think by taking the stand and being able to tell her story directly from her mouth, I think she... I think she really enjoyed that, and I think she also thought that it was going to be a way for her to continue on this narrative and continue the lies that she had laid into foundation. She pretty much stuck to her original version that this was self-defense, that Alex was the one who had come on to her, that he had physically gotten on top of her, that he had a knife in his hand and he tried to cut her clothes off and she basically saw no other way to get out of this in, in order to protect herself than to stab and defend herself. And I think she really wanted to betray herself in front of the jury as being this meek, sort of timid, friendly young girl. And I thought, I think I think she thought she was going to be able to use that to her advantage because no jury is going to want to convict someone who looks and acts like Ezra McCandless did. The sheer brutality of Alex's injuries in relation to the lack of injuries on Ezra, that would be the thing to me, looking back on it, that if I were, if I were looking at this as a juror and I was seeing that this woman walked away from this with no broken bones, very little in the way of actual injuries, some superficial stuff. But then you look at Alex and he's stabbed a countless number of times, many of which could have been fatal. And by somebody who was 30, 40 pounds smaller than he was, to me that was, that was the biggest piece right there, is just the, the, the brutality of it. And what I would say was probably the most important piece here. I know the public opinion was that she appeared as though this this wasn't so impactful for her. I, I think the jury made some comments that she did not seem remorseful about what she did. My understanding is that she, she wore her hair in different ways every single day that the trial went on, that it seemed like she was enjoying the attention that she was getting surrounding the trial. I I had heard that when Jason was testifying that she almost seemed like she was trying to get his attention while he was testifying that she wore a sweater that he gave to her without having spoken to him. I guess I can't say too much about how he feels. I'm sure it's a mix of emotions between guilt and just sadness and confusion. He was very close with Ezra. I imagine that when you're calling someone your, your wife and they're referring to you as your husband and then you find out that they stab someone to death and then watch a trial take place and watch them get convic convicted of, of homicide, um, that, that's got to be very jarring. And again, like many other people involved in this case, I'm sure he, he took him a while to cope with everything that was happening. She got all giddy and, and girlish looking at him. She got kind of all flustered and, and uh, I thought that was very bizarre. She wasn't believable. And obviously a three-hour deliberation on a first-degree intentional homicide case by a jury, they didn't find her believable. On November 1st, 2019, Ezra McCandless is convicted of first-degree intentional homicide for the murder of 24-year-old Alex Woodworth. She is later sentenced to life in prison with eligibility for parole after 50 years served. I think she was in shock. I truly think that she thought she was going home at the end of the day. And she just stood there kind of stone-faced. She said she was sorry. She was sorry to the family. And that she loved Alex very much. I don't think the judge believed her. I mean, you stab someone 16 times and leave them to die. You didn't try to help him. You didn't call anyone to help him. You left him. I think that comes down to how she testified, how she acted in the courtroom, the evidence that was there. I think that, you know, they looked and examined from, from all sides, and they found her guilty. Alex's parents, specifically his father, have publicly said that they do forgive Ezra for what she's done. Of course, forgiveness isn't going to bring their son back, but 
It probably helps them sleep a little bit better at night and helps them live with a sense of peace to be able to forgive her. I actually look back on it and I'm proud of the work that we did in the sense that somebody was eventually going to find that car and they were going to find Alex. But what evidence would have been lost as a result? How long would it have taken to find him? Maybe the knife's never recovered. Maybe these ne the phone's never recovered. Footprint washes away. All this evidence that could have been lost. So I'm, I'm proud of the work that we as a team did that day. We kept working on it. It's very sad for the Woodworth family. But again, I like to think that because of the work we did that day, we were able to, you know, save some evidence potentially that was able to be used at trial later on. So I think it's a fair sentence based on the crime. I think in this case there is closure. We found out what happened. Again, based on the evidence, we found out what happened. I think the evidence told the whole story, whether or not Ezra wanted to tell the truth about what happened. And if I was a family member and Alex was someone that I cared about closely, I would feel some closure after this case. Yes, she would be in prison for a very long time or potentially the rest of her life and wouldn't be capable of doing something like this to somebody else ever again. A life taken, a community grieving and in shock. But there is some small sense of peace and knowing that McCandless's jealousy won't claim another life. July 2017, a young woman is viciously attacked in a car park in broad daylight. In a busy car park where there's lots of people looking, something like this would have been incredibly shocking to witness. The victim, 23-year-old university student and fitness blogger Molly McLaren, is stabbed multiple times as she returns to her car after a morning gym session. Police quickly arrive on the scene and discover her ex-boyfriend, Joshua Stimson, nearby, covered in blood and holding a knife in his hand. He doesn't care what anybody sees. It's not about getting away with it. It's about killing her. That's the key. The dominant emotions was rage and jealousy. And that was a fatal cocktail. That overwhelming jealousy that he had, that she was carrying on without him, that she didn't love him anymore, drove him to murder. This was her first real relationship and it was the relationship that killed her. Kent, in the southeast of England, is an affluent area located close to the city of London. When people consider England and people say the word Kent, most people would just want to move there. It's got the coastal experience, it's got the urban experience, it's a collision of everything that's beautiful in the UK. It's inspiring middle class people with good jobs, young, probably with kids, and mums looking for gyms and general good living. It has about 1.8 million people who reside there, but it also suffers with quite a high crime rate from the very serious cases of murders through to what you would see in town centres where fights break out. But one horrific incident in a car park in Chatham in July 2017 sent shockwaves throughout the community. 23-year-old university student Molly McLaren was returning to her car after an early morning gym session when she was shockingly and brutally attacked by an ex-boyfriend, 26-year-old Joshua Stimson. Molly left the gym, got to her car, opened the door, sat down. The next thing she would have known was the passenger side door open and suddenly he was there and he was in the seat next to her, he had a knife and he attacked her. 
26-year-old Joshua Stimson, a double glazing salesman originally from Stoke-on-Trent but now living in the Kent area, had been in a relationship with Molly for six months before she broke up with him in April of that year. It's very unusual for a crime of this nature to take place. It's at the most serious of, of crimes that we ever see. And in the nature in which it was done as well, in public, for so many people to see, and the brutality that was seen in this crime makes it very unusual and very rare. A member of the public who tries to intervene to help can't even pull him out. Even when he's slamming the door and his legs trying heroically to remove him from that car, he can't do it. Multiple 999 calls are going into the police around what is happening. People obviously incredibly upset. The police are rushing there as quickly as they can. First responders arrive at the car park where they observe an agitated young man in blood-soaked clothing with a knife in his hand. The police couldn't believe it when they arrived because bear in mind, most perpetrators leave the scene of a crime in this circumstance, but that's not what occurs. He's pacing up and down standing there in his white vest and his black shorts, covered in blood, almost waiting for the police to arrive. And then, he says, my Hilda. So he knows he's going to get caught. It wasn't about putting up a fight. It was just about doing what he set out to do, which was to execute her in cold blood. Joshua Stimson is arrested and taken into custody. Detectives begin investigating the sequence of events leading up to the attack, starting with finding out more about 23-year-old victim Molly McLaren. They could see that she'd had a gym kit and that she'd clearly been in the gym and it wasn't long before they were able to piece together who the suspect was who was covered in blood. Molly McLaren is one of those individuals, when you think about a family background, that most people would want to experience... Molly grew up in the quiet village of Cobham in East Kent, amongst a close circle of family and friends. Molly was especially close to her mother and confided in her throughout her childhood and adolescent years. Her mother and her were considered best friends. There was nothing that her mother wouldn't do for her, and Molly felt the same. And it wasn't just about that family dynamic, it's the wider dynamic, because you have to think about family not just being a bloodline, it's about the friends that you have around you. Health and fitness was a big passion in life. She also thought it was very important that other people were motivated by health and fitness as well. Molly was in her second year at the University of Kent studying health and fitness, so she was really dedicated not just to her own health and fitness, but to a career investing in others' health and fitness too. She also starts blogging about her health and fitness journey and quickly gains an online following. Her main love in life was the inspirational blog that she would run, all to do with fitness, fitness tips and health food suggestions. This was a, a brilliant success for her. She had many followers and fitness and health was her top priority. She had a, quite a big online presence. She had Instagram where she would do fitness videos for people to try and motivate them. She was using it firstly because she looks amazing. So there's something really beautiful about the photographs that she's posting, but also the little videos that she was doing. It's inspirational. But Molly's interest in health and fitness has its roots in a darker period from her childhood. Molly, throughout her young life, suffered from bulimia and she also had problems with anxiety. She saw it as a way to help her through those times. She did struggle as she was growing up, like lots of young girls do. She struggled with her self-image, she had some mental health problems, an eating disorder. These issues she's had when younger she'd come to terms with and conquered and was part of how she tackled her new fitness and health regime. You're growing up at a time right now where everything is about the way that you look. What Molly was doing was figuring a way forward with that and she was using her experiences of a platform for change for others to see, you know, it's possible to overcome, it's possible to show your vulnerabilities and it's possible to help others realise that they can achieve the same. Towards the end of 2016, Molly is starting to achieve the goals she had set for herself. And there was another part of her life that she wanted to explore for the first time. 
Molly was an individual who hadn't actually had long-term relationships. You know, boys were not a big part of her radar. And part of that is because she had a really great life with her family. Secondly, she was aware of her own issues. And when you've got issues about self-image, you don't necessarily want to be in relationships because you've got to battle those demons. But also when you're overcoming those issues, what a relationship can do is destabilize you. So I think that she was getting to a point where the foundations were set and she was ready. During her second year at university, Molly begins to explore the world of online dating. Online dating is obviously incredibly popular nowadays, but it does come with certain dangers to it. The person that you're in conversation with, which can be for many weeks and months before you actually meet them, might be displaying a different personality to what they really are. They might be a very different person altogether. She went on the internet. She went on Tinder. Because that's where the average person meets somebody that they can relate to and connect with. And that's exactly what she did. Molly met Stimson on the Tinder dating app. She was flicking through it and found what looked a really good-looking boy. She wanted to find the right person. At the time when she was at university, this would be somebody that she wanted to be part of her friendship group as well. And so Molly eventually finds somebody that is compatible for her. Joshua Stimson, a 25-year-old double glazing salesman from nearby Rochester, appears to be the perfect match for fitness-conscious Molly. He was somebody that presents as having had struggles, being an individual who's vulnerable, and bear in mind, that is super attractive to somebody else who has been in that situation. Molly is aware of the potential dangers of online dating. She begins talking, but only on text and, and over the phone for about three or four months, just to get to know her. That's the kind of personality that she was. This wasn't a whirlwind online dating romance. They discussed for some four months between themselves finding out about each other before, four months later, they met for the first time face to face. And it's at that point that she feels that she has met the right person because they share a love of fitness. He also talks about suffering from mental health problems themselves. So they share something there as well that they can talk about. And so they found that, you know, perhaps this was the right match for her. He's a really good looking guy. So from the outside looking in, you're thinking this could work. They look like they'd really connect. They look like they would really fit on a looks level. And so that, in this day and age, is your first port of call. How do they present to the world? Well, they present it very effectively. Molly and Stimson now begin a romantic relationship. And she introduces him for the first time to her family and friends. He came over, as her family said, very much as a nice lad. He seemed a decent man, interested and loving her. And they had a bond between them. Molly introduces this new partner to her friends and it isn't long before we start to see what looks like coercive and controlling behaviour. You could have a relationship online for quite some time before you get to the meeting stage and that can be quite dangerous because you don't know who that person really is and what they're really like. It's only when you meet them and they're actually starting to interact properly, that you're going to get the non-fake person. It's at this point in their relationship that Stimson's behaviour towards Molly starts to change. He starts to try and take her away from her friendship group, bombarding her with texts, saying wherever she goes, he wants to be as well. So not giving her the space to have the other part of her life where she's just out with friends enjoying herself and relaxing. From the get-go, I think she was realising this is too intense. He seems to be too familiar with me on a level where he feels he can control me right from the early days. But everybody wants to give somebody a chance, particularly if you've not had any relationships before. What have you got to relate it to and compare it to? So initially, she's probably thinking... You know, let's give it some time. But family and friends of Molly McLaren are starting to have real concerns around new boyfriend Joshua Stimson. And the relationship between the couple is about to take a turn for the worse. Kent, 2017. 
23-year-old university student and fitness blogger Molly McLaren has begun a new relationship with 26-year-old double glazing salesman Joshua Stimson. Molly met Stimson on an online dating app only months earlier, but already there are concerns about his controlling and abusive behavior towards her. I genuinely think that where Molly is concerned, there were always some misgivings from the get-go. I think Stimpson was somebody who couldn't hide his true self very easily. I think his jealousy and his aggressive tendencies, which were passive initially, were such that it was unavoidable to notice. I also think that Molly was somebody who had a level of empathy, and also she was somebody who picked up on the vibes that were not positive. Molly could sense that she was not being treated as an equal partner in life. That Stimson thought that he should be in control of her, that he should own her, that she was a possession. But of course she was a very bright, intelligent, independent woman, more than capable of making her own mind up, and was never going to stand for that. Initially, he would have been love-bombing her, he would have been making her feel like the most important person in the world, he would have been showering her with his own vulnerabilities so that she feels that she has to reach in and make him feel better about himself. And then, as time goes on in those early days, he starts to become more controlling. Some offenders will be really jealous of their partner even talking to their mum or dad or cousin. And that's that sense of entitlement, that sense of ownership and owning that person. And they can easily start to erode the relationships with their friends as well by being difficult, tricky, not pleasant to be around. And these are tactics that offenders use to try and isolate the victim, which then means they have more control. Molly's family are worried about Stimson's behaviour towards their daughter. He's at a family party, and during this family argument, he actually goes upstairs to the bathroom and he's video recording Molly, who's obviously distressed because this is an argument she didn't want. The mother comes up, walks in, and he's trying to show the video footage as if to say, look at what's wrong with Molly, look at what the problem is with Molly. So very early on, these kind of coercive control aspects to their relationship are occurring. It becomes very difficult for families in this situation when they see things about the person that their daughter or son is seeing who they don't like and they will have concerns. Obviously, as a parent as well, you look and you think, well, I have more experience, I can see what that person is like. And so positive intervention from families and friends when they see something they don't like in relationships is hugely important because it can prevent something going very wrong later on. And Stimson's behaviour also causes alarm among Molly's close circle of friends. They didn't like the way that he would try to exclude them. Uh, they didn't like the way that he would seemingly deliberately cause rows, particularly in public, and then storm off with her saying, you're going to have to come with me. It was the very obsessional, possessive nature that alienated them. Turning up unannounced when they were in the relationship, not phoning in advance and then actually when she was studying he would be there just sitting on her bed and that's not right even to the point where he quits his job which apparently she was extremely angry about and she's writing her dissertation she needs to be able to concentrate and you can't concentrate when you've got someone looking over your shoulder there but molly still wants to give stimson every chance to change in the relationship when you grow up in a family that's full of love, you want to give things a chance. When you've seen people in your family have successful relationships, you think, well, maybe this is about me being oversensitive, maybe I'm just being negative, maybe it's my mental health issues that are causing the fractures, maybe if I just try harder. So she goes through the motions, even when she knows she doesn't want to be with him. Finally, Molly confides in her mother about the ongoing problems in her relationship with Stimson. Molly had a very close relationship with her mum. And, of course, you know, in that kind of relationship, she tells her everything. And mum realises that, that this is a bad relationship for her to be in, and so intervenes, suggests to Molly that she shouldn't be in, in this relationship anymore. So, you know, Molly takes it upon herself to end the relationship because she listens to her friends, she listens to her mum, and, of course, she's bright enough herself to understand that this is very unhealthy for her. Molly works up the courage to end the relationship and tells Stimson it's over between them. 
Molly just said, that's it, I've had enough. Stimson begged and pleaded and implored, take me back, you can try this again. But there were just too many incidents and too many times when he was trying to belittle her and demean her, and particularly his approach when she was with her friends in public. Stimson has one last opportunity to win Molly back. But then there is a holiday that they've booked, and they've booked it early on in the relationship. So the consequence is, do I stay or do I go? Do I remain at home or do I chance that holiday? Molly did go on that holiday to see if it was going to work, and it was essentially make or break. And she knew really quickly into that holiday that it was not right and that he was not hearing her. The problem was, instead of just saying it's over, I think Molly wanted to help him as a friend because of their mutual background of mental issues in the past, when often it's much quicker to have a clean break. It's a mistake. It's awful from the moment that they get there, and she's actually letting people know what an unhappy time that she's having. So when she comes home, that's when she makes the final decision. I've given it my best shot. It's over, and I want you to leave peacefully. And we have to remember that that was Molly's mindset all the way through. She just wanted the relationship to end. Molly's mind is now firmly made up. She wants Stimson out of her life as soon as possible. When she comes back from the holiday and she ends the relationship, it takes a small amount of time before he realises this time it's serious because there have been other times where they have essentially returned to the relationship. So he's probably thinking, I just need to push harder. The minute, and it doesn't take long for him to realise that he's not getting his own way, he's angry, he's rageful, he's scared because she's a beautiful young girl. He knows that other people are going to be interested. So as opposed to accepting the breakdown in the relationship, he starts to get nasty. When Molly breaks up with Joshua Stimson, his personality becomes even more worrying as he bombards her with texts, begging her to take him back. And we're talking hundreds and hundreds of texts. Stimson was able to find out the passwords to her social media sites, which gave him you know, full access, and he was able to plunder them and plant most malicious and uh, wicked lies. He starts to get nasty. He starts to send Facebook messages to people that she knows. He starts to suggest that she's taking drugs, which is very upsetting for somebody who's studying a particular area of health and fitness and wants to be an inspiration to other people. He takes over her Facebook profile, suggesting on the Facebook where obviously she's got loads and loads of friends who follow her, that she takes cocaine and very worrying and very upsetting for Molly at the time. And of course now he is becoming a very, very dangerous individual towards Molly. Basically, he makes her aware that anywhere you go, I'm going to know about that and I'm going to break every boundary that sets in society and breach them so that you don't feel safe. Her mum says she knew everything about her, so when he started posting things on social media about her taking drugs and things like that. The mum knew immediately, I know my daughter better than that. Stimson's efforts to discredit and embarrass Molly have turned her world upside down, but things are about to get much worse for the 23-year-old university student. Kent, England, 2017. 23-year-old university student Molly McLaren has ended her relationship with 26-year-old double-glazing salesman Joshua Stimson after he became increasingly abusive and controlling towards her. Stimson has taken the breakup badly and has now begun a vicious online smear campaign against Molly. He hacks into Molly's social media accounts and posts derogatory photos and messages about her online, all visible to friends, family and followers. The one thing that we have in our world is our privacy and our security around our personal items of technology. The idea that somebody can actually spy on us when we're in our very private moments, that makes every area of our world totally unsafe. Molly starts to suspect that Stimson has gained full access to her personal messaging accounts and is now stalking her movements. She felt that he was invading that privacy, he was violating her rights in that way. She didn't know how, 
but she could tell that he knew things about her or he found out things about where she was going that she hadn't put online unless it was in a private situation. Molly's family and friends urge her to go to the police. Molly wants the police to take down all these things that Joshua Stimson has said about her on Facebook so that she can get back to her normal life. But she's very, very worried that he's going to come to her house and harm her. Molly went to the police twice. The first time laid out all this campaign of harassment and stalking and the police did phone up Stimson and gave him a serious warning. And his reaction was, well, I have done nothing wrong. And if you think I have, well, you haven't seen anything yet. If the police warn someone like Joshua Stimson to say, stop what you're doing, and they don't, that's a red flag for the police there. If they can start to build a case against that person, they will. But it has to be, you know, looked at all the time, the bombardment of text messages, the trying to go into the friendship group to try and gain access to the person that you want to. But Stimson ignores the police warnings and continues his abusive online behaviour towards Molly. Needless to say, within a matter of weeks, he was at it again. He completely ignored all their warnings. He continued the stalking, continued the harassment, and it was getting worse and worse. So she went again. I genuinely think the police struggle where stalking is concerned and where jealousy is concerned. When you have young people with intense relationships saying, this person won't leave me alone, they're getting involved with attacking me online, they feel often that this is just a case of young lovers struggling. And unfortunately, that bias means that they fail to understand the gravity of the actions of certain people. Increasingly concerned about Stimson's erratic and unpredictable behaviour, Molly even approaches social media companies in a bid to prevent his breaking into her online accounts. There are different ways in which you can try and take these images down. You can contact Facebook and show that you know, this is not you and it's your account has been compromised and they can help you through that process and try and get all these things taken down. But we know how difficult that can be on social media as somebody can have something taken down in one minute and create a new profile the next. Even Facebook, who they had been in touch with as a family and said, this guy is putting the most grotesque stuff about me on there. They took the stuff down initially, but then when it went back up, they were like, oh, well, we can't really do anything about it. And there is a nonchalance when it comes down to these kind of experiences for lots of young people. Molly attempts to continue her life, despite the campaign of harassment against her. It can be quite dangerous to block them completely. The advice is to ensure you keep one route of comms open. You don't reply to them. You've already said, do not contact me. But keeping one route of comms where they think they're getting to you, A, it keeps the evidence, but B, it can prevent the escalation. Now, the escalation starts when they are completely blocked and they can't get to that victim. So they're more likely to just try and turn up. One evening, Molly is at a pub with her friends and Joshua Stimson has arrived with this other girl. And of course, at that point, Molly is probably thinking, well, maybe he's moved on, maybe he'll leave me alone. But of course, that's not the case. This was just another way for Joshua Stimson to be with Molly. Very confusing for Molly. Does he know that I'm at this pub tonight? I've told all of my friends, they've turned all of their social media off and blocked him. Now he walks in with another girl and that could be because he's thinking, I'll make her jealous. Even if he's hoping to achieve jealousy on her side, all she feels is relief. Of course she does. You're thinking to yourself, let him have moved on. Let somebody else have this problem. What really counts is he's giving her a very powerful message. And that is no matter where you go, no matter who you're with, I'm going to be there. It's about alerting her to the knowledge that he is everywhere, literally like an omnipotent force in her world in this moment. Molly is uncomfortable with the sudden appearance of Stimson in the bar and decides to leave early. She's probably thinking for the first time, dare I hope, dare I believe that maybe this situation is going to change and I am going to be free of him. But unbeknownst to Molly, things had just taken a pivotal and tragic turn. Unbeknown to her, there were two very serious developments. Number one, 
As she drove home, she was being followed by Stimson in his own car. And secondly, Stimson had joined her gym. Molly is a member of Pure Gym, which is near the River Medway, right by the docks in Chatham. And it's here that Molly travels to for her morning workout session the next morning. It's Thursday, June 29th, 2017. She's not feeling super positive that everything's going to be all right with Stimson. She's still nervous, but ultimately she's moving forward with the life. She goes to the pure gym. She starts exercising. Behind her in his car was Stimson. He drew into the car park. He's caught on CCTV on the stairwell going up thinking, coming down, going up, coming down, clearly going over in his mind, am I going to do it? And eventually he thinks, clearly, now, that's it. It's now or never. And he marches into the gym. All of a sudden, Joshua Stimson has appeared next to her as she's working out in the gym. This, again, is an escalation in his behaviour, which must have frightened Molly. And you instantly see the power play, because he goes to exactly where she is. Bearing in mind, he's empty and yet he places himself next to her. He lays out his mat just five feet away from Molly. She turns to him and says, what are you doing here? You're following me. And is now very scared. She's messaging her mum and telling her mum, you'll never guess what, he's he's appeared next to me. Her mum immediately does the right thing and says, come home, I don't want you there. He then leaves and goes to his car in a car park. This car park is full of cars. It's a Thursday, it's in the middle of the day. There's lots and lots of people going to a local shopping centre there. And he drives around the car park, laying in wait for Molly to come out. She's totally unsuspecting. As far as she's concerned, he's gone. And arguably, she leaves thinking, hopefully he's got the message. At that time, Molly is completely unaware that after Joshua Stimson left Pure Gym, he is waiting for her. So she packs up her gym kit, heads to the car, opens the door, sits behind the wheel. The next second, the passenger door flies open. He yanks the car door open and begins a brutal and vicious attack where he stabs Molly 75 times. And he strikes with such a degree that I think it's hard for people to really compute. One bystander sees the commotion taking place in Molly's car and tries to intervene. One very brave man could see what he thought was a couple arguing in the car until he realised that there was something in a man's hand. And he then raced over, he banged on the bonnet, went over to the passenger door side, slammed the door against Stimson's leg to try and distract him. That bystander, seeing the terrible events unfold in front of him, tried to stop Joshua Stimson from attacking Molly to try and prevent what was an awful attack. Stimson emerges from Molly's car and walks around with a blood-soaked knife in his hand. This is in broad daylight, 11 o'clock in the morning, in a public car park. There are witnesses all over. Stimson doesn't care about what happens next. Stimson's sending a message to her in the world. No one has the right to control me or leave me. And I'll ultimately make sure that anybody who does pays the price with a life. Emergency services receive numerous 999 calls about the incident, and police and paramedics quickly rush to the scene. Police obviously have to firstly detain him as quickly as possible, but what they also want to do is get to Molly as quickly as possible to see if there is any way in which they can save her life. Stimson is taken into custody by police without a struggle. They have to take Stimson away and immediately have him medically examined because he seemed in some sort of catatonic state that is staring eyes and covered in blood. For the officers, seeing somebody that has been attacked in that way would have been, you know, very, very difficult to see as well. But they have a job to do and they tried their best along with the paramedics and ambulance crews that arrived at the same time to try and save her life. The paramedics arriving at the shopping centre spend precious minutes attempting to stabilise Molly. But tragically, she is pronounced dead at the scene. Police try and locate Molly's family to inform them as quickly as possible. Social media travels really fast. 
Her family were finding out about a killing online before they were actually informed by the police. Also, her father at the time was working on an oil rig, so the consequence of that was that he had to be informed by his wife that he would never see his daughter again. Police now begin their criminal investigation to piece together the sequence of events leading up to that tragic morning in the car park in Chatham. When an incident like this happens where somebody has been murdered, lots and lots of procedures kick in. The crime scene itself will be cordoned off. They want to get all the forensic evidence they can, the car in which she's in, the CCTV that might capture the incident. And of course then he would be questioned about what he's done. June 2017, Kent, England. 23-year-old university student and fitness blogger Molly McLaren has been murdered in her car in broad daylight by a jealous ex-boyfriend. Joshua Stimson, a 26-year-old double glazing salesman, is arrested at the scene after making no attempt to flee the area. Police now launch a full-scale murder investigation into the brutal and senseless killing. They have to establish who is the victim, who is the suspect, what was their relationship. His movements before and during the attack itself. They'll be going to his home addresses, they'll be going to other places, maybe checking on previous girlfriends to make sure that there are no other victims. Joshua Stimson himself is brought into custody. He is himself a forensic crime scene and they want to take swabs off him. They'll be trying to take clothing and everything else that they can find out about him, taking any digital phones and computers, something where they can show the evidence and the way in which this is built up. They'll have Molly's side of all the phone calls and the text messages, but they want to see evidence from his side as well. Investigators delve into Stimson's past relationships and quickly uncover a pattern of abusive behavior against two of his previous girlfriends. Both were victims of coercive control. Both were victims of very abusive behavior, including being spat at and treated very reprehensibly. Stimson had spat drink in her face in a pub in front of all her friends. Another one told how that she'd been on holiday and she received messages from Stimson saying, I'm going to come over to where you are and drown you. Stimson is charged with the murder of Molly McLaren and is remanded in custody pending trial. For Molly's family, the sudden loss of their daughter in such tragic circumstances leaves them heartbroken. The family were absolutely distraught at what had happened involving a man they knew to be dangerously, uh, almost psychotic, and a uh, threat to their daughter, and that this was a horrendous consequence of months of stalking and harassment. A hugely important role is the family liaison officer, the person that is put essentially into that family, and will be there from day one right the way through the court process, and quite often a long time afterwards, supporting the family. Part of their role is to gain evidence as well. You know, things that the family will tell them might be evidence they don't realize. So of course, when you look at Joshua Stimson's relationship with Molly, you see things that the family can help with, things that friends can also give evidence about. Investigators continue building their case against Stimson leading up to his trial. The police that become involved in this particular investigation will be homicide detectives led by senior officers dealing with exhibits at the scenes, the digital information and evidence that is gathered from phones and computers. When you collect all that together with your crime scene forensics and your CCTV, that's when you're building your case, ready to say, right, we have enough to charge Joshua Stimson with murder. Stimson goes on trial for the murder of Molly McLaren at Maidstone Crown Court in February 2018. The trial starts and Joshua Stimson pleads not guilty. And when you think that all the evidence that the police have against him, witnesses who saw it was him, the forensics is covered in Molly's blood, you'd think that, why are we going through a trial? It's the worst thing to put a family through in that particular situation where they're going to have to listen to every part of that evidence and witness statements and the medical evidence of what happened. 
Stimson, when he was in court, was really emotionless. That was one of the things that I think her family struggled with. We're talking about such an emotionally turbulent time for them. And they're looking at the perpetrator who's literally stolen the life of somebody they love more than anything in the world. And he just is non-reactive. He then, through the trial, pleads guilty to manslaughter. And this is on the suggestion that he wasn't in control of his capacity, the mental health that had caused him to do it. His lawyers claimed that he was suffering from a bipolar disorder since his childhood, which created such an unbalanced personality disorder that he could not be held responsible for the crimes that he had committed. The argument is that he was abandoned by his mother, and the abandonment by his mother fractured him to such a degree that he felt totally fearful of anybody else ever leaving him. We can feel sorry for anybody who's been through an abandonment level, but if we were really to argue that a parent leaving is enough to make us wish to kill somebody, well, there would be a lot of people turning up dead. It's as simple as that. Prosecutors present CCTV footage in court of Stimson purchasing a knife and other tools in the days leading up to the attack. They find out that he's bought knives and pickaxes and things like that in other places close by. We understand that people do at times lose their sense of reality. They have psychotic breaks, for example, but these happen in moments. They don't happen over two days where you're able to coldly go and buy the weapons that you're going to use and to plan the execution of the person that you want dead. So they were able to build their case around his actions. He provided them with all the evidence that they needed. This wasn't somebody who was out of their mind. This was somebody who was highly in control, just as he had been highly in control in Molly's life. He was highly in control in Molly's death. The prosecution had a very strong hand, not just with Stimson's actions in his relationship with Molly, but his actions in his relationship with previous girlfriends. And two came to court to tell exactly how badly they had been treated, which reflected so much of the relationship issues that he'd had with Molly. The trial concludes and the jury quickly reach a verdict. The jury spent very little time, barely an hour, to return a verdict of guilty to murder. Nobody bought into this belief that he was struggling with his mental health to a point where he had lost his mind. In fact, they recognised that this was a cool, calm execution on his part and that he wanted Molly dead. The judge gave Joshua Stimson a life sentence with a minimum term of 26 years. And in this particular case, because Joshua Stimson was so dangerous and, as the judge said, posed a huge risk to women and girls, that... The 26 years is what he will serve. That will be the first day that he can even be considered for parole. And of course, if he doesn't behave himself in prison or they assess that his dangerousness still exists, then he can remain in prison well past that 26 year date. Simpson wasn't out of control. There was nothing out of control about him. He knew what he wanted to achieve and he achieved it very effectively. And for a period of time before that, he executed that plan judiciously. Molly's family are relieved at the guilty verdict and long sentencing for Stimson. There was an exhilaration at the guilty verdict, even though, as the family made clear, you couldn't possibly bring Molly back. Their lives were still destroyed. People might think, you know, could Molly have done anything more? And, and really, no, not really, because Joshua Stimson already had that personality, that coercive and controlling, that bullying, that narcissistic personality. And when he met Molly and started that relationship and she could see these red flags and her family and friends could see the red flags appearing about his behaviour, she's done what she needed to do and she wanted him to go away. But he didn't want her to be with anybody else. When you are up against someone like him, unfortunately, it's very, very difficult for it all to end peacefully and amicably. Molly was somebody who would have benefited this world greatly. Every human being arrives with potential, but she was somebody who didn't just recognize that potential, she was working on it so that she could help not only herself, but other people too. She came from a loving family. She would have had a future full of support and care. She would have no doubt had a family of her own that would have thrived because of her being the parent. And she should, to all intents and purposes, have carried on making an incredible mark in this world. Following Molly's death, her parents set up the Molly McLaren Foundation to raise awareness and provide support for people affected by eating disorders. 
Molly's parents tried to make a positive out of this terrible tragedy and set up the Molly McLaren Foundation. And they raised a lot of money to help other people who struggled with eating disorders. So young people who themselves were affected with their mental health, that were struggling with their self-image, this offered them support and help and advocacy. And that's very powerful because it speaks of wanting to make sure that long after the perpetrator is put away, the actual thing that matters remains, which is the human being whose life was stolen. In October 2018, the University of Kent acknowledges Molly's achievements during her lifetime by posthumously awarding her an undergraduate diploma in sports and exercise for health. They attended a degree ceremony at the University of Kent where they received, on behalf of Molly, her posthumous degree. And as they... Uh, reached the, uh, the dais and was presented with the, uh, uh, the scroll. The whole assembly rose as one, uh, gave her a, a riotous standing ovation uh, to reflect the love for Molly and the tragedy that had unfolded. The legacy of the support her parents have created for others and the university marking her academic prowess, that's meant a great deal. Thank you.